Good morning. Welcome to this uh, second day of the scientific conference of the Human Brain Project. We have lots of uh, exciting things in store for you throughout the day. And what better way than to start with uh, an amazing keynote speech. Uh, we are very happy to have Giacomo Indivieri here from the Neuroinformatics Institute of the University of Zurich and ETH Zurich, uh, who will talk to us about the neuromorphic computing and engineering past, present and future. Uh, Giacomo has gotten his degree in electrical engineering from the University of Genoa, and then he went through various places, uh, uh, Caltech, his habilitation at uh, ETH Zurich, and uh, for 25 years he has been at the Neuroinformatics Institute, where he's heading the Neuromorphic Cognitive Systems Group. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to welcome you, Giacomo, here. For the next 25 minutes, we are ready for a great ride. Giacomo. Thank you. It's, uh, it's really a pleasure to, to be here as well. It's an honor to have the opportunity to tell you about neuromorphic computing and engineering and to go over the past, the present, and the future. Uh, yes, I'm from the Institute of Neuroinformatics from the University of Zurich and ETH Zurich, and I will be talking about the various activities in the neuromorphic computing community, including those that have been uh, put forward in the Human Brain Project. And uh, I would really like to take this opportunity to give a tribute to uh, Professor Karl-Heinz Meyer, who, who left us, sadly, almost exactly three years ago. As I'm sure you all know, he was one of the main forces, the main drivers of the neuromorphic pillar in the Human Brain Project. He was really a visionary that, that uh, inspired many students and, and was, was uh, uh, inspiring also an inspiring mentor and a colleague. So I, I think this is the perfect opportunity to, to give tribute to Professor Karl-Heinz Meyer who was really pushing the boundaries of both neuromorphic computing technologies and artificial intelligence. Uh, and also within the scope of the Human Brain Project, trying to create a link between artificial intelligence and natural intelligence. And so in the next couple of slides, I would just like to give a sort of a introductory background just to bring everybody on the same level of uh, both artificial and, uh, neuromorph uh, artificial and biological intelligence and the links to neuromorphic intelligence so that then we can really appreciate uh, the past, the present, and the future. And this is just a very, very uh, summary slide uh, on um, the analogies and the differences between artificial neural networks and biological neural networks. I am sure most of you know all the details, but as I said, it's just to to bring everybody on, on the same page. And uh, so here on the left, you see a, a diagram of the McCulloch and Pitts neuron, which is really sort of the workforce of, of artificial neural networks, which works by integrating multiple inputs or actually summing multiple inputs uh, gated through uh, multiplying factors, the synaptic weights, and then taking a nonlinearity and sending the output of this operation uh, as a binary, either one or zero, to the next uh, level. Uh, this is a, an artificial neuron that is, is used to simulate uh, neural networks, and the simulation of these networks is completely detached from the underlying hardware. So the, the algorithm can be run on an ARM processor, on an Intel processor, on an FPGA. It really is something that is detached from the physics of what is doing the computation, the hardware that's doing the computation. This is really different from biology, where we have physical neurons, and you see more on, on the right diagram. These are drawings, schematic drawings of uh, pyramidal cells uh, in which you can appreciate the different morphology. So these are also units that integrate their inputs through some nonlinear and multiplicative factors. So they, there are also synaptic weights here, but also temporal dynamics and nonlinear transfer functions of the individual synapses. Uh, and then uh, they also integrate uh, these currents that are being produced in the dendrite. And then uh, depending on the state of the neuron, depending on various conditions, an action potential is generated. But here the also, it's not just a zero or a one output. This is really also something important. It has temporal dynamics. The propagation delay of these action potentials also changes with various properties of the neuron, whether there is myelination or no myelination, whether the axon is longer or shorter. And these are also things that actually change during the course of the 
you know, the processing of the network. Learning is not, and plasticity is not only working on the synapses or the synaptic weights, but the whole neuron is changing its morphology, the length of its axon, the, the delays in its action, uh, action potentials. Uh, it's changing the learning rule itself. There is metaplasticity, and, and it's, it's really a much more complicated structure than the simple McCulloch and neuron McCulloch and Pitts neuron diagram that we see on the left. And really what is important is to appreciate this difference that in, uh, in biological neural networks, these processing systems compute through the physics of their uh, computing elements. So the algorithm is the architecture. So the hardware substrate is the algorithm. And, and this is probably one of the biggest differences that uh, explains the um, huge gap there is in, in power consumption in artificial neural networks and uh, biological neural networks. And, and speaking about artificial neural networks, again, another very, very quick summary slide to, to bring everybody on the same page. Uh, I just wanted to remind everyone that artificial neural networks have been around for many, many decades now, uh, for actually several decades, but only recently they became very, very popular. And in, in fact, they started to outperform classical optimization and engineering approaches only from 2009 on. And the success of these neural networks came actually around, you know, from 2011 on when uh, so-called convolutional neural networks, CNNs, trained through a very popular uh, learning algorithm, the back propagation algorithm, achieved for the first time superhuman performance in machine vision. And this was uh, really mainly due to the technological progress, to the fact that the, these graphical processing units became widely accessible and very powerful, much more powerful than what was available in the 80s, and to the fact that there was a huge amount of data available to train these networks. So it was a combination of things. And of course, also to uh, improvements in the algorithm and, and progress in computer science and theoretical neuroscience. This has been a, a huge success, and most of these uh, algorithms are now being used in our daily lives, in our cell phones, in our computers, for doing image uh, recognition, for searching for pictures of beaches or cats, for recognizing our own uh, speech when we talk to our phones. And, and these networks have been improving throughout the years. From 2011 on, we now have really remarkable networks. The approach that has been taken to make these improvements actually uh, has been sort of a brute force approach. If you see this plot here on the left, you will notice how the various types of networks that have been proposed in the literature uh, have been in, uh, improving in uh, accuracy, so with this top one accuracy on the y-axis, but have also been getting faster and faster. So they've been using more operations per second, more of these gigaflops uh, on the, on the x-axis. So this brute force approach is essentially saying if we have more computational power, we can just put more number crunching in these systems and get more accuracy out of it. The other thing that you should notice from, these, uh, from this plot is the fact that these circles are different in size. And that is related to the number of parameters that are used in these networks. And these networks started out with a relatively small number of parameters, but now they start to have more and more number of parameters, which requires more and more memory to store these parameters and then to train and computation time to, to train them to find the right set of parameters and hyperparameters. So as uh, convolutional neural networks and deep neural networks outperform classical approaches, many groups around the world started to uh, optimize the, these networks. So far, the AI field has been mostly dominated with some notable exceptions, but mostly not dominated by these incremental approaches that try to uh, improve the performance by just using more brute force com power, computational power. And for example, the latest, or actually one of the latest uh, networks that has been proposed that is, is remarkable and, and can achieve amazing results is this uh, GPT-3 network that is used in natural language processing and now in many other domains. It's a huge network. It has 175 billion parameters and it requires 350 gigabytes of storage to store and memorize all of the parameters that it uses. And if you can imagine training this network, finding the optimal size, the optimal set of parameters uh, requires a huge amount of computational power, which in turn requires a huge electricity bill. And it's been estimated that training this GPT-3 network uh, required at least $12 million. 
So I hope you appreciate that, you know, we, we are experiencing this revolution where we have these neural networks that are changing our life, but it is requiring significant amount of power in terms of computational power and in terms of energy. And this is uh, not sustainable. This just cannot go on for uh, in the same way that it's, it's been done in the past few years. It's been estimated that actually, if we don't change the way of doing things and we keep on do, following this approach, in 2025, 20% of the global world energy will be dedicated to computation. We will actually reach a point where we either turn on the lights in our house or we do computation. So it's, it's really becoming a serious problem that uh, r large uh, research initiatives like the Human Brain Project, governments around the world, large research centers, companies are starting to uh, tackle. So this, uh, th there, there are some problems and limitations in the standard AI approaches, and this energy one is one of the most important ones. I already mentioned about this 20% of the entire world electricity, and you can find, if you will have, uh, get access to the slides, you can actually click on these links, you will find all the details in the, in the uh, links that are the reference to these claims. There are other, uh, actually the, the main uh, reason for this energy consumption is due to the hardware, uh, underlying hardware, these von Neumann architectures. And uh, you would imagine that this computation requires power, but it's not really the computing, the, the doing the multiplications that is, is the power consu consuming part. It's really transferring the data from memory to compute and compute to memory. The data transfer is really the problem in these uh, architectures and these computers. So DRAM access, so accessing the random access memory blocks uh, is, is really power hungry and it's at least 1,500 times more energy costly than doing the multiplications and accumulation operations in these types of uh, hardware accelerators. So there are these energy uh, problems that we have to solve, but these are not the only problems that artificial, the standard approach in artificial intelligence is facing. Another important problem is the fact that these algorithms are limited in, this, in, this, in their scope. So it's this narrow AI problem. These deep networks are programmed to perform a limited set of tasks and they operate within a predetermined, predefined range. They cannot generalize like humans or animals do to, to uh, solving other problems as easily as uh, natural intelligence systems. And uh, in fact, even Jeff Hinton himself, uh, who is the inventor of or one of the inventors of backpropagation, is deeply suspicious of that algorithm and the sort of the AI approach. And he doesn't think that this is the brain works. The future depends on some graduate student, hopefully among you, that is going to suspect everything that we say and, and try to find alternative ways. And I think the AI community is really stuck in a local minimum, try to make these incremental approaches, whereas brain-inspired computing and, and the type of work that is being done in the Human Brain Project might lead to finding alternative solutions that could be better, just like real brains are. And uh, several, there are several approaches to do this. The Human Brain Project is pushing many of them, and uh, there are others that are just from the technology point of view. So this is a diagram that is showing how these approaches can be done by looking at new materials or looking at new architectures and packaging. But the important one is that if you look on the, on the uh, diagonal, the neuromorphic approach is one of the most promising ones. So now to quickly go through uh, neuromorphic, uh, the term neuromorphic was coined by Carver Mead in the late 80s to describe these hardware systems that contain spiking neural networks. And now the community actually has broadened up. There are several different aspects of neuromorphic computing. If we, if we look at it, there is the original aspect from the group of Carver Mead that goes back to the 80s that was really rooted in biology and using analog circuits, subthreshold analog circuits and asynchronous. From 2008 on, the community of material scientists and device physics people started adopting the same term neuromorphic to refer to these nanoscale devices that can be used as synapses because they have a conductance that changes its state and the, the device remembers the state of the conductance. These are called memristive devices or memristors. And then there is the new wave of neuromorphic computing architectures. The Human Brain Project has been, has been pushing this with the, the Heidelberg system and the Spinnaker system, brain scales and Spinnaker, but also other companies like IBM and Intel started to look into these approaches that are using standard technologies to really implement spiking neural networks. 
and we can go over the various uh, some examples, representative examples of hardware architectures that have been proposed recently uh, from the Spinnaker group and the BrainSkills group in the Human Brain Project, but also, as I was saying, Intel and, and uh, IBM, but also other academic groups around the world like Stanford uh, with the BrainDrop or even in Zurich in our institute with various types of devices like the Rolls or the Dynaps. These are names for basically chips that have spiking neural network uh, circuits on them with different flavors. And I'll quickly go through... Um, the various approaches. The, the Spinnaker approach is really a custom digital computing architecture. It's been, you'll learn more about it, but just uh, summarizing, it's, it's a fully programmable architecture, very flexible with fixed point arithmetic in pseudo real time. And it's been optimized for spiking computational neuroscience simulations. The Loihi chip is, in, is a research platform with asynchronous multi-core chips simulating spiking neural networks, again, for basic research, optimized for prototyping and scalability, similar to the True North chip by IBM, which is also an asynchronous digital architecture that can simulate uh, spiking neural networks. It's a bit less flexible than the Loihi, and the advantage it has is that it has more, more neurons but the cost, the price that it pays is that it loses in flexibility. These on, on the top row were the sort of the digital approaches. On the bottom row is the mixed signal analog digital approaches. And brain skills is, is really one of the most impressive uh, examples here that has a very large uh, structure with both analog and digital circuits working on full wafer scale. It's, it's probably the only one in the world that has a full wafer scale system with analog limited precision accelerated time circuits and digital for communicating spikes. And also this approach, when it was first proposed, it was designed for faithful reproduction of neuroscience simulations. The standard, the Stanford approach and the Zurich approaches are similar in that they use these uh, slower sub-threshold analog circuits. They are more noisy, but they are real time. They're not accelerated time. So for for interacting with the environment, they have the advantage that you don't need to warp time scales. And because they are using smaller currents, they're a bit also lower power. Uh, the Stanford approach has been is pushing for large scale, for scalable system. And the Zurich approach is, is pushing for uh, on-chip learning and plasticity for still exploring. So this was sort of an overview of the various approaches. I should mention, though, that the Human Brain Project is, is really uh, standing out because those architectures that I presented have been scaled up to very large scale systems. And you can see directly on the Human Brain Project uh, website that they have these amazing platforms uh, where the, you can connect to these machines with millions of neurons that you, you can simulate in real time or in accelerated time, millions of neurons. So the BrainScale physical model machine located in Heidelberg implements these analog circuits uh, for simula or simulating and emulating up to 4 million neurons and 1 billion synapses. And the spin approach has 1 million ARM processors that allow you to program these machines, these computers, to do very large-scale simulations with architectures that have been optimized for transferring spikes and transferring data in a very power-efficient and, and time-efficient mode. These are sort of the neuromorphic computing approaches, and these, the two that stand out are the human brain ones that I mentioned. The neuromorphic, the title of this presentation is Neuromorphic Computing and Engineering. So I'd like to differentiate the neuromorphic engineering approach from the neuromorphic computing approach with the following slide. The neuromorphic engineering approach goes back to the ideas of Carver Mead. As I said, it was deeply rooted in biology, and it really is um, designed to, to try to understand how the brain works by building systems. So there is no agenda in making products or making simulation engines for neuroscientists. It's really a, a research tool, like you would use MATLAB or you would use experiments or pen and pen, uh, paper and pencil, to try to understand how the brain works. And so the idea is we are doing neuroscience studies. We are neuroscientists. Uh, so we study fundamental neuroscience, the principles of neurophysiology, neuroanatomy. But also we want to understand how these circuits, these neural circuits compute. So we also study theory of computation. And because we want to implement these with electronic circuits, we also have to study microelectronics, electrical engineering. The idea that Carver Meat had was that we try to use electronics to reproduce the properties of single cells. Uh, 
We can do that because electronic circuits have the same physics. For example, we can take advantage of Boltzmann distributions, we get natural exponentials. The transistor channels in subthreshold uh, carry currents through diffusion, just like the proteic channels carry current through diffusion. We're using electrons instead of ions, but the basic physics is the same. And of course, because intelligence emerges out of behavior, once we have these chips that can reproduce the properties of individual cells, we need to integrate them into sensory motor actuated systems to really try to see if we can uh, see, uh, see the emergence of intelligence in these artificial spiking neural network computing systems and behaving systems. So these are the uh, basic uh, principles of this neuromorphic engineering approach. And really the, the goal is to, is to build cognitive agents that can interact with the world in real time. So that's why we try to slow down silicon so that it can have the same time constants of the real neurons and the type of signals we're interested in processing. And we're using real brains as an as a inspiration and in particular, we look at, we try to, because we are still trying to understand how these circuits work, we start from small scale systems. You don't need to look at human brains to try to understand the principles of computation in, in nervous systems. You can also start by looking at smaller scale brains. And the B is, in, is a wonderful example I always show um, because it's, it's a machine, it's a computing machine that weighs less than a milligram. It has less than one millimeter cube of volume less than a million neurons, way less than the number of transistors we can put on chips, and it can do amazing things. So if you think of it, these, these computers can have the bee interact with the environment in real time in closed loop settings. These, these uh, circuits in these analog computers, the, the brain of the bee, uh, use both analog and digital computing elements. A spike is a all or none event. They exploit nonlinearities in temporal dynamics. They leverage noise. They process complex spatiotemporal signals. They can reuse the same computational primitives to do flexible computing. And they express intelligence through behavior and interaction with the environment. So if we want to understand how to build brain-inspired computing that have these types of properties, we really have to rethink the nature of computation. We really have to make a radical paradigm from the standard way of computing. So uh, if you think about it, the standard way of computing is based on von Neumann architectures, where you have a CPU on one side and memory elements on the other. You either have cache or SRAM or DRAM or hard disks on the other. And as I told you, the price of computing is transferring the data back and forth from processing to, com to memory. In brains, you know very well, the synapses and the neurons are at the same time the site of computation and the site of memory. So these are co-localized. Memory and computation are co-localized. Or if you want, there is in-memory computing. So if we want to, if we want to build new types of brain-inspired computers, we really have to use this approach where we use physical space. We use parallel elements of processing elements. We don't time multiplex like you do in standard computers. We try to co-localize memory and computation. And if we want to save power, we also have to be careful in using passive circuits that are data-driven circuits that don't burn power if nothing happens, because computation is very sparse in both uh, space and time. And of course, to do that, we have to exploit all the properties of the transistors and memristors. This is the, the space aspect of this neural computation. The time aspect is also very important. We should, if we want to really reduce power consumption and do brain-inspired computation, we have to understand how to do computing by using time as a, as a variable that represents itself. We should let time in, represent itself. We, we should not decouple the numerical integration times from the physical dynamics that are going on in the hardware. So this is useful for interacting with the environment in real time. It's useful for matching the circuit time constants to the dy dynamics of the signals we want to process and so to have perfectly matched filters and for synchronizing the real world natural events with the computation that's going on in the hardware. An example of these uh, of circuits and, and systems that follow this approach are the ones that I was telling you are being developed in Stanford, in Zurich, and in a few other places around the world, in, in Germany, in the Netherlands, in Groningen, and, and so on. Here, because this is the one that I know best, is the, the one we have been developing in, in Zurich, I just want to give you a quick overview of, of what these chips look like. 
So they are basically using standard uh, VLSI uh, fabrication technologies, and they have many, many elements that are copied and pasted. So for example, if we have a thousand neurons, we have a thousand physical circuits that are laid out on the surface, on the 2D surface mm -hmm. of the chip. And you can see here the in, in the inset, the zoom of a, of a circuit in which there is essentially a lot of memory building blocks, memory elements, SRAM and TCAM. And on the side, on the far right, some computing circuits which implement the neural dynamics and the synaptic dynamics. You can have multi-core architectures and then you can route the spikes across cores through routers, which are standard digital circuits. Those are actually very small and those you can see here in the middle of this uh, layout uh that they, they are these router circuits the the dynamics are are taking also little space what's taking most space is actually the memory uh that's the most part because we are distributing memory within the computational fabric the, this is distributed and is taking up space but we hope we can take advantage or we will be able to take advantage of these new memristors that are being developed which hopefully in just a few years will become available as a standard option in these fabrication processes and then we can really integrate dense arrays of synapses neurons and memory elements in the same area so this is sort of the present the this is where we are now we are waiting for these memristor technologies to become available to be able to build these and now if we go back to the present also not only of the neuromorphic engineering approach but also of the neuromorphic computing uh, this is sort of the present and the near future. We are now at a point where we can use these platforms that the Human Brain Project made with eBrains. Intel actually just announced the Luihi 2 just a few days ago. So also the Intel and the Samsungs and the IBMs of the world are making progress with the uh, commercial uh, attempts to, to do neuromorphic computing. And academia is making progress with this neuromorphic engineering approach by co-integrating memristors, uh, analog circuits, and then again, trying to come up with new plasticity rules for doing low power, small scale computing. And if you think of the small scale, if you think of insects, this small scale computing can be effective when you have to do low power sensory processing at the edge, when you don't need to connect to the cloud or you don't need to connect to large scale computers. And so my uh, almost last slide or second to last slide is also pointing out what the future is for the tasks and the computational uh, advantages that can be done if we look at the way that computers have been evolving and we look at what's coming next. So we are going from uh, you know the 90s, 60s, 70s where we're, there were whole rooms filled up with computers to do computation to an era where we had desktops. You probably didn't, but I remember I had a huge desktop under my desk with a huge monitor. And, the, and in those years, we would use those to do computation. Now we are finishing an era where we have all of that computational power in our pockets with our cell phones. And the next wave will be this edge intelligence where we need to have computation in very specialized devices. For example, in our refrigerator to tell us if the food has gone bad, in our t-shirts to wearable to tell us you know the state of our health in our shoes to tell us you know the whether we're doing enough exercise these are going to be very dedicated and specific application specific uh, intelligent chips very much like small insects that do not need to do general purpose computing they do not need to invert matrices to do excel spreadsheets they really need to do very very dedicated sensory processing and the type of engineering approach and some of the circuits that are being developed also in the human brain project are going in this direction so that is where the future is leading us and here there are also a number of startups i'm highlighting the one in zurich since sense but there are several other in the world that are actually starting to make products in this direction and um, making having success with this uh, approach. So my, my final slide uh, is uh, sort of um, a plea to uh, make students interested in this uh, research area, because now is the perfect time. The, the, even nature with this uh, editorial shows that big data needs a hardware revolution, even though artificial intelligence algorithms are making headlines, the biggest potential is in understanding how to you know, create hardware that can, with the physics of the hardware, implement brain-like computing. And we are now at a point where conventional AI is uh, you know, increasing power requirements. We cannot follow the standard approach. New emerging memory technologies are extremely promising and they are now ready to be, become exploited. Neuroscience, as uh, also through the Human Brain Project, has made tremendous 
progress in uncovering powerful and robust neural processing methods. So this is the perfect time to really put bring all these things together and create a new field of neuromorphic intelligence, if you want, which brings together neuromorphic computing and neuromorphic engineering. And here I'm just highlighting there is a new journal that recently came out. Uh, this is sort of an advertisement because I'm one, one of the editors. It's called Neuromorphic Computing and Engineering. It's uh, open access and it's actually free to publish until the end of the year. No fees for, for people that submit. And also there is a EU funded coordination action that is bringing together these, these different aspects in, of the communities. Neuroscientists, memristive device people, computational neuroscientists and neuromorphic engineers to really create this uh, new emerging field. So I hope this uh, was um, e enough to give you a quick uh, taste of what neuromorphic computing and engineering is and to show you what, where it can lead in, in the future. And I thank you for your attention and I'm ready for questions. Thank you very much, Giacomo, for this uh, exciting uh, presentation and then the trip that you took us from the past all the way to the present and, and, and the future. Uh, uh, in the last two or three minutes of your presentation, a whole bunch of questions uh, came and one is more exciting than, than the other, so I'm not sure. I, I don't think I'll be able to pose all of them to you, but, but let me start from the one I meant to ask you and then maybe we'll do a second one and then we'll wrap up. What is the potential of quantum computing uh, for neuromorphic computing? Quantum computing is another fascinating emerging technology. It, it's quite complementary to the neuromorphic engineering approach where I told you we would focus on small scale, closed loop sensory processing systems. But it is uh, a very nice complement to the neuromorphic computing approaches that are being developed in the Human Brain Project. So the, the Spinnaker and the Heidelberg um, platforms and the Spinnaker 2, which I, I had on the slide, I forgot to mention, that's also a very exciting new development. And uh, for now, they're, they're following parallel pathways and they're making progress independently. But there are already several attempts to bring the two together and, and try to use inspiration from neuroscience to exploit the properties and the physics of the quantum computing architectures. So it's really not my field of expertise. I, I do not have any specific details. I can only tell you it's, it's a very exciting time and we will likely see very exciting uh, uh, proposals in the near future on, on bringing together neuromorphic computing and quantum computing. Excellent. Often the, the great interest is in the edge of when we're to, to exactly to at yeah. the interface. Uh, let me grab another one. The next Loihi chips will be based on four nanometer technology. What engineering edge the numeromorphic computing systems from HPP possess today, uh, whatever it is, how long will they keep that edge against industrial giants if slash when a well-defined application niche for an MC appears? How can we compete? I I think we, we, we do also in Europe, but also in, in the States, the edge that we have as, a, as an academic community and as a now sort of a large uh, community that had, uh, has received a, a, a significant investment is uh, our own brains. We, we have the know-how, we have the competence of understanding how to use these spiking neural network circuits to do computation. This is actually something that is still missing. The technology, of course, these giants, they can, they can really push the boundaries of technologies. They can use the most advanced technologies. But what is the bottleneck, what is actually slowing down progress is not really the technology. We can put tens of millions of spiking neurons on, uh, on platforms, either single chip or multi-chip platforms. The problem is how do we use these neurons to do computation? And that requires exactly what the Human Brain Project has been doing a dialogue and an interaction between different disciplines going from neuroanatomy to neurophysiology to computational neuroscience, computer the theoretical neuroscience, computer mm -hmm. science. And this is the edge that the Human Brain Project community has and also sort of the academic communities around the world working on these topics. So we can actually ride the wave of uh, Moore's law and the progress that Intel is making because in a few years, these, these technologies will become accessible also to us. But we then we now uh, can make progress in understanding how to use these circuits to really do computation and then maybe even outperform the standard brute force approaches that the AI community has been following so far. 
This is great. This is great. Um, and, and let me give a, th a third one, uh, very short answer, if, if you may. Uh, let time represent itself. Could you, this could be interpreted philosophically, very in an engineering way. Could you just give us one hint of what you meant by that catchy phrase? Yes, yes, absolutely. So in standard von Neumann architectures, when you're simulating a neural network or simulating any algorithm for that matter, the time scales of the simulation are completely detached from the time scales of the computing hardware. So you can simulate some evolutionary process in milliseconds, or it might take you a night to simulate some molecular dynamics that in, in real time in biology takes a few microseconds. So they're, they're completely detached. If we want to really have low power computing, we need to have a computing substrate in which the circuits have the evolution of the computation with the dynamics that are matched to the signals that we want to process. For example, if we want to do speech recognition, you know, phonemes are coming out of my mouth about every 50 milliseconds. So we should try to build uh, neural, artificial electronic neural circuits that have the same time constants. So these analog circuits, like in the, in the uh, um, Heidelberg Brain Skills project, uh, we could use uh, circuits that have time constants that are well matched to the ones that we want to process, and that would help us to reduce power and bandwidth. So in that sense, time would represent itself because the physics of the computation would, would just run through natural time. The, the circuits would just you know, decay with 50 milliseconds. They would resonate with if they recognize one phoneme and not resonate if they don't recognize a phoneme and so on. And it's very, very different from right. the standard way that is being done in uh, DSPs, for example, in hearing aids or in, in standard computers. Excellent. One more clapping uh, for you for this fantastic presentation. Uh, you, I see you Thank have you. 286 claps, virtual claps. So uh, I guess everyone is excited. It's really Too many an honor more for questions. Me. I'm, I'm really grateful. Excellent. Thank you so much, Giacomo.